All right. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about Mortis philosophy before we get into uh, any discussions of the product itself. But um, so what I usually start with is this quick question, and that is, what does it mean to conform to WCAG 2.1 success criteria 1.1.1? If you're not intimately familiar with, with all 72 or so of the WCAG success criteria, I don't blame you. Um, this success criteria is the one that says that all non-text content that is presented to the user has a text alternative that serves the equivalent purpose. And there's a, a bunch of, you know, exceptions in the, uh, in the spec, but uh, what most people think of when they think of 1.1.1 is the, uh, is for uh, us to have all attributes for images. And that's really not what 1.1.1 says. And part of that is there's a definition in 1.1.1 of what non-text content even is. So as a result, we really do got to think through what that means, what, what the non-text content is, what it means to provide an effective text alternative and, <clears throat> um, and, and how to do so. And so testing for that is equivalently complex. When you begin to understand what I just said, you'll, you'll understand that testing for accessibility is really complicated. It's really hard to get right. It's really hard to ensure that it is all done the same across the team. It's one thing when you have only one person, you don't, you don't have to do anything else with one person other than uh, hopefully believe that that one person has a complete and thorough understanding of accessibility. When you start having a team, uh, then, then you have a lot of variation. If you're familiar with that sort of environment, you know what I'm talking about. The bigger the team, the bigger divide is going to be uh, regarding how much accessibility knowledge the team has. And that's actually true even among teams of seasoned professionals. There might still be specific strengths and weaknesses among the team. I'll give you a great example. Me, I've been doing uh, accessibility consulting for 20 years now, and still I just have a bad habit of not thoroughly checking color contrast sometimes. Sometimes if, if the UI's contrast doesn't seem egregiously bad, then, you know, I, I just move on. But there are some cases where the contrast could look okay and actually still fail. And so uh, this is why something like Mortis has to exist in your team. A robust accessibility methodology starts with having the right resources. <clears throat> Any tool uh, that you use to perform audits needs to offer uh, completeness in your testing. So no more making it up as you go, which is what a lot of people do. A lot of people will uh, just load up the page or whatever they're testing, start tabbing around, start listening to it on the screen reader or something like that without any real goals other than to uh, hopefully surface some accessibility issues. But you need to, especially in a compliance situation, have a complete view of all the things that need to go into having an accessible product. This also is gonna mean that you need accuracy. You need to be able to, all of your team members need to be able to identify and understand exactly where things stand and why. Uh, you need reliability. <clears throat> you need to be able to understand or, or uh, you need to be able to trust rather um, that the uh, that the results that you're gonna you're gonna get are gonna be accurate across the entire organization, regardless of who is doing the testing. Um, you need repeatability. The repeatability is gonna utilize the exact same criteria. Apologies for the background noise. Uh, utilize the exact same criteria, the exact same. Uh, um, test techniques across the entire team, no matter who is doing it. And this in turn will make your results uh, defensible because having this consistent uh, single source of truth for your testing and for your reporting and your results is gonna add to defensibility uh, if and when 
something happens uh, illegally. So this is exactly where Mortis comes in. This is why Mortis exists. So Mortis is a accessibility assurance platform. And what I mean by that is it's an efficiency aid. It provides the ability to manage accessibility testing efforts across the entire organization. And it offers the ability for testers to do their work faster and more reliably. Quite simply, accessibility testers using Mortis can achieve 100% test accuracy with orders of magnitude more efficiency. Even internally with, with our own team, uh, we have seen a 57% increase in efficiency in our own work when using, ten, or when using Mortis. So <clears throat> let's take a look at uh, Mortis. I'm gonna log in. Um, by the way, the uh, product is currently undergoing a redesign. So next time you look at Mortis, it could look very different. We're in the uh, work we have been on our staging environment, uh, the redesign, but we're still working out, working on some tweaks. So I'll mention some areas where the uh, where the product is going to look different as we go along. And of course, the first place it's going to look different is here on the landing page. The redesign is also much faster. All right, so what we have here are, uh, is our list of pro projects. You can collaborate with others, which is why there's also an affordance here to show whether you own them or whether they're shared with you. Um, but the first step here is to create a project. So this is just as uh, the, the um, definition of a project is with say PMI. It is a unique work effort with a defined start and, and outcome. Uh, so I'm going to use my favorite whipping post, which is CNN for, for this. Um, so CNN is going to be my project name. I can give it a key as well. Uh, my demo audit of CNN. Uh, so that's going to be listed here. Uh, for, for my description, and then I choose which WCAG level I'm going to be uh, testing. And so I'm just going to choose uh, AAA. And then I add a project. Now we're taken to the project, project landing page, and this is going to be redesigned. This is going to be part of the redesign. It's going to be, it's going to look a good bit different. All the primary pieces are going to be here though, which is our project uh, details here at the top list of issues that we don't see yet because we don't have any uh, link to the checklist uh, component and then uh, collaborators. So I can invite other people to work on this project uh, just by adding their email address. So I'm going to add Carl Groves gmail.com. Uh, that's going to go there. It's going to say Carl Groves at gmail has been invited. And what's going to happen is underneath this little bell, the Carl Groves at Gmail account is going to have an invitation. And when he accepts it, he'll be able to work with us. Another thing that's been added is a global component. What we have found during audits is that there are often going to be cases where we discover an issue that is pervasive enough to be considered system wide. So for instance, uh, the color contrast, a lot of times, uh, specific, uh, um, specific color contrast issues may reside in the entire design uh, based upon the colors that were chosen during the design. So it wouldn't make sense to, uh, to log that for every component. But let's talk about what components are now. Um, so this takes us to over to uh, the CNN site, which is what I want to demonstrate really quickly. In modern web development, we know that web pages are not simply a series of static HTML pages. So on CNN, for instance, this black bar here that has the navigation in it is one piece of code somewhere in their code base. And so as a result, it really only makes sense for us to test this one time. Same thing goes for the footer. The footer content here, always the same, doesn't make any sense for us to test it multiple times. Uh, another thing that you'll notice on CNN, let's say a story page, 
is always going to have they have the uh, I use CNN so much for these demos that I already recognize the, that they have three different layouts for these things. Uh, no, nope. you, you look upset. Why are you upset? So the um, the story pages they're going to be there's going to be one of three types. Uh, there could be a video mm -hmm. player type, a photo gallery type, or a, a single picture type, and then they have these the, the text underneath it so we know that's a that's only in there once in the code base so what i'm going to do i've already played tv chef but i'll show you how i do this is you're going to want to go into your code base and select which parts of the page you're going to be testing and the way i do that is i open up dev tools uh, now all browsers have a dev tools type thing um, but the, uh, but the uh, Chrome DevTools, you can right click on the area that you want, select inspect, and it should bring that, to, bring that up here for you. But what I want really is this thing where it says header. As a matter of fact, I could even go up here to that. So I would select this, I would copy that outer HTML, and then I would, um, then I would save that as a file. So I'm going to show you what I mean and why that's and why that's good. So I'm going to call this header. <clears throat> I'll give it a description. The header component holds the uh, global navigation and search. Then, uh, then this part here, the relevant content categories, is a list of the types of content that I want to test for. Uh, obviously, to be comprehensive, you want to test for everything. However, there's chances that not everything is really relevant. For instance, tables. I'm guessing that there's no tables in that, in that, uh, in that component there. So I could select all of these and then deselect tables, or I can allow Mortis to auto detect it. So that's actually what I'm going to do. So I've already, I already have a folder on my, uh, on my desktop, which is mm -hmm. called CNN-audit. I have that header, header uh, code saved as header.html. I'm going to upload that. What's going to happen when I upload this is it's going to detect which content types are actually relevant. I'm also going to select a screenshot of that. Um, this will help my fellow testers understand that, um, understand exactly what I was referring to. Um, screenshot of the header. And I add component. And um, that's on the list. I'll add another one. I'm going to call the footer. Footer exists on the bottom. Obviously, in the real world, you're going to want something more informative. So the report viewer, who, the end user who consumes the data that you give them, understands what the heck you were talking about. Footer image, screenshot, footer, and there we go. Now, another thing that we can do, and I'm not gonna do it here in this case, but what we could do is we could give it a URL. So I could, I could do, let's say home page, something like that. And I could just type in a URL And if I did that, what Mortis would do is it would load that page up in a browser. It would grab all the code. It would take a screenshot and all that other stuff. But really testing an entire page is usually not a great idea in terms of efficiency because again, all you're gonna do is be logging issues on the same repeated stuff over and over and it just doesn't make any sense. But when we're done adding our components, uh, there's a couple of things we can do. We have a test plan that we can download. This will download a PDF file for us that has all the screenshots and all the information. And what we do internally at Tenon is we share that test plan with the customer before we get started on testing, just to make sure that we're both on the same page, that they understand what we're testing. Um, we see here that progress is already at 7%. And why is that? Because of the auto detect feature. The auto detect feature has determined for us which portions of the <clears throat> content were relevant or not. I'll show you in a second. Um, but let me just des describe what we're seeing here. First off, again, during the redesign, this broken uh, wackiness here with the top of the, of the checklist is, is fixed. Um, but in general, this is the way the checklist looks, even in the redesign. 
and it's just a list of things that you need to check on. Now we do have a distraction free view, which is great. <clears throat> so what I do, I have, I have two monitors and I'll have the checklist open in one and the thing I'm testing in the other and I can just go through and, and I just have this distraction free mode that shows me everything. Um, we have all of our content categories here, uh, CSS, document structure, language and content, keyboard and focus control, images and non-text content, navigation, forms, tables, custom controls, dynamic content, multimedia. So the multimedia ones were the multimedia and frames and iframes were the ones that were uh, marked as not applicable. Uh, timeouts, frames, iframes, mobile oriented. So these are all the content categories that we need to go through on our checklist. And as you can see, like I said before, 100% is shown here uh, for the ones that are not relevant. So I know that there's no tables on either of those. I can also mark those as not applicable. And we're now 16% more. Uh, let's see, we can go through uh, dynamic content. There's none of that in either of those. And so this is where we start seeing a bunch of efficiency with, with the ability to uh, mark things as not applicable that aren't. Um, and so there you go. So now we see we're already progressing to 21%. The other thing that we do need to do though, is we need to go through all these checklist items. And it seems a bit on the tedious side and trust me, when you do this for a living, it really is. But this is how we get 100% coverage on our testing. All we have to do is go through each one of these things, determine if the, uh, the uh, item has passed or failed, and move on. So I'll, I'll answer this one here. This is a good, good one. Uh, provide a line spacing of at least 1.5 within paragraphs. So you might be wondering, well, I don't know what that means, and, uh, and I don't know how to test it. Well, that's why each one of these things is a link. So when you click on that, we get a, uh, we get a new uh, window here, a modal window here, and, um, and uh, the information is presented. So CSS09 is the number for this check item, and the title here, provide a line spacing at least 1.5. We have some metadata here, which content category it is, what the test selector is, uh, don't worry about that. Audiences, those are the people who are, are, who, are, um, uh, who are relevant for this thing, the severity for the individual populations, which WCAG success criteria this is mapped to. Then there's issue content. So the issue content contains the, the description of what the issue will be when we log this. I'm gonna skip that for a second because I'll show you this somewhere else. But uh, verification steps are here. Use DevTools to check CSS for line height settings that are less than 150% of the computed font size. Are there any exceptions? None. And so there you go. So all you have to do is follow directions. So uh, we're going to say that it passes in both of these cases. And uh, we're going to say it passes here. But then let's see, avoid the use of justified text alignment. There we go. Here's our same information. Uh, there are exceptions on this one. There are also uh, a, a longer verification steps. And what we found is that the footer fails. Okay, so the footer fails and that's no good. So we're gonna log an issue. Now this issue screen uh, probably, hopefully looks familiar to you if you've ever done any, uh, any uh, issue logging in a system like JIRA or GitHub or something like that with a couple of new differences for us. Um, one is we already show the content category. That's because that's where we came from on the checklist. We show the check item. This is the, uh, this is the item that we had to check on. We have the component listed here. That's gonna be the footer because that's where we came from on the checklist, but you can add uh, other items. You can add other things from your components. Uh, you can do that later or you can do that now. Um, then uh, the title. So the title and the description and the issue code and the remediation guidance are already filled in for you. 
and you can change it if you want to. So what this is really is kind of an efficiency aid. You don't have to use this information. You can change it. Uh, you can modify it. You can make it more specific. So in practice, what we usually do uh, internally is we'll, we usually will edit this and we'll say, you know, uh, the, the paragraph of text in the footer is justified or something like that to make it more specific because for us uh, internally we have a style guide and our, our style guide really has a, a, a theme, a prevailing theme throughout it of making sure that whatever we write is, is, can be understood by anyone uh, who has a basic understanding of, of web, web development but who may not be familiar with the system itself. Um, so that's why we get a little bit more specific. And then in practice here, what we usually do is we may add some specifics here. So we will say um, the paragraph something like that, some sort of specific reference to what we're testing or anything like that. And then, of course, the, uh, the basic uh, issue description here uh, is, is filled in the rest of the way, and that way you don't have to continue repeating all of these sort of basic things. Long sections of just fully justified text creates inconsistent spacing, blah, blah, blah. Um, you don't need to put that in there every time you write an issue for this sort of thing. All you need to do is add the specifics. Uh, now this is a rich text editor, which means that you can also add images, you can add links, you can do formatting. So for instance, if you wanted to attach an image to the, to the issue so people understood what you're talking about, there you go. Uh, and you can add an infinite number of images, of course, uh, when it comes to good styling, you know, you may want to keep it only to what's relevant. So in this case, I probably shouldn't upload an entire picture of the footer. I would put wherever the justified text was. Uh, issue code, that's the issue code that, uh, that we found in the, um, uh, it, it, that's the issue code that we found. We have some generic issue code in certain cases. Uh, just for an example, but you can obviously add the, um, um, the proper code there for whatever the issue is so that the end user of your content can understand what the heck you were talking about. Um, so, and then the recommended code is what you would, um, you would change to make it compliant. Uh, remediation guidance, again, boilerplate remediation guidance that you can spe uh, specify or change here references information, attachments, although generally you don't want to put an issue, uh, an image attachment here, you would want to put a, uh, maybe a movie. Uh, sometimes we do, we do quick MP4s demonstrating how a screen reader behaves in a, in a specific spot. Finally, metadata fields. Uh, the metadata fields will allow you to edit any of the various pieces of metadata, like what type of issue it was, who was impacted, so on and so forth, what the applicable standards are, and things like that. You add the issue and you're taken back to the checklist. And then from there, after the after you're done with with uh, the checklist you just, or with your issue, you just keep on going. While I'm here, I will show you the redesign. Oh, I can't type. So our redesign is here. Uh, boy, that's taking a long time. 
Redesign is here. Uh, the, the navigation on the left is going to be a bit different. So, uh, but I want to show you uh, the, what a done project is going to look like. So this is our done project. Uh, our components are going to be listed a little bit differently. Our issues list is going to be here. And this is similar to the, um, this is very similar to the issue display. Dang. I'm not going to show that because there's customer stuff in there. Uh, so this is, this is just a demo also. So this is our issues list in here. Um, and you can also add comments to the issues. So during the triaging of issues or during the um, uh, QA process, we'll typically add, add some comments in here. Like, I'm not sure I understand the issue. Please improve. Goodness. You can add comments, so on and so forth. Your coworkers can then respond to them. Uh, and now let's look at the reports. So the reports that Mortis will be able to generate for you, uh, there's a couple of them. One is uh, the pre-flight report. So the pre-flight report is a report that we have that will let us know if the um, if there's any problems, and not really problems so much as things that we could improve. So there is there are two issues here that have no embedded image. So what we usually want to see in an issue is that that we have a screenshot in it so the user understands what's going on. So we that takes us back to here, and we can put an image in there for the uh, for easier understanding. Uh, there's also an HTML report and uh, executive summary that are also HTML. The same exact reports are available as PDFs. Um, the PDFs that are generated by Mortis are all PDF UA compliant. The HTML report is going to or the PDF report and HTML report look identical except for the fact that the HTML report has the, the, the bar on the left, the, the navigation stuff on the left. Um, but the reports that we get, that, that uh, Mortis generates are extremely thorough and detailed, provided of course that your issue descriptions are. But you have a boilerplate summary and methodology. We give an accessibility grade and we have, a, we have a, a piece of documentation at the end of the report that describes what the accessibility grade is. But accessibility grade is really awesome because it provides you with, a, with an, actual, uh, uh, an, an actually objective score of how you're doing. The accessibility score is created through the use of the checklist if you use the checklist properly. So what it does is it takes all the relevant things, meaning the things that you did not check off is not applicable. It uses those to grade your performance based upon passing and failing, just like in school. <laughs> That's where this grade comes from. So obviously, you know, if you have 200 things in a checklist and only 100 of them are relevant because you marked 100 of them off as not applicable, then we're only gonna base the grade on the things that were relevant. So that's the other cool part about accessibility grade is it's not gonna take into consideration things are, that are not relevant. Um, we don't think that you pass by virtue of not failing, you pass by virtue of passing. Uh, so then we have a description of the detail, of how the uh, findings are reported, also on the severity. Uh, and then we have our, um, our issue list. So text has insufficient color contrast. And there's a whole pile of metadata that we saw from before that are attached to each of these. So what are the error types, the severity, all that sort of stuff. And these are all links. So if you want to see, okay, what are the issues that affect uh, people who are deaf? Then you see that and you're taken to an appendix, which is issues by, uh, issues by affected population. And it shows us how, how many of these issues affect who. Now this is a dummy report, so it, it, yes, contrast doesn't affect deaf people. We understand that, but this so this is just a dummy report. 
um, but it also takes into consideration um, uh, except, uh, severity. You can link to a report for issues by severity, uh, issues by component, issues by population, which we already saw, WCAG success criteria, WCAG level, issues by platform, issues by priority. All of this information can be used for people to understand really what's the status, what's going on. Uh, the executive summary is really awesome. The executive summary basically takes the same data that we created and presents it in a way that's useful for people who are non-technical management types who just need the, the, the raw, you know, where are we? So we have accessibility grade, description of the data, and then we, all of those other things like the issues by component and that sort of stuff is broken down and charts are presented and so on. So that's really cool. Another thing that you can do is you can download a CSV file of the report. CSV file is gonna be a CSV file that has all the issue information in it. Um, so we see that here and uh, the description is there and so on. Uh, this can be used to import into whatever issue tracker that you have, as long as it has a importing functionality. And most of them do. If you are lucky enough to also have a, uh, also use either GitHub or Jira for your, uh, for your issue tracking, you can then import it directly from the, uh, from, uh, from, from Mortis. So I'm going to show you, I'm not going to show you how to do that right now, other than to let you know, it does require that you're on Jira or I'm sorry, Atlassian cloud. You have to have a user's token. Uh, you, and that's why I'm not de demoing it because I don't want to show my token. Uh, the, the username of the user the organization URL, and then you can choose the projects and so on. And when you do all the things you need to do, to push your issues, then they go right into JIRA. So all that information that we had in our issue reports can be pushed right into JIRA. Uh, and the same thing goes for GitHub. If you were to choose GitHub, there you go. You would choose your token, your repo owner, and so on and so forth, and then import all the things. And finally, Mortis is the only product on the market that creates a VPAT accessibility, uh, VPAT formatted accessibility conformance report. Again, keeping in mind that this is a dummy project uh, and the data is not uh, obviously going to be accurate because we just did um, uh, a dummy project with some fake issues. The, the VPAT here that we're showing you is not going to be, um, and not going to be uh, very terribly accurate. But what happens is, uh, and this is going to be changed as well, by the way, this is, uh, these are level A things marked as not applicable and that's not accurate for, for the VPAT. But, uh, but in cases where there, the issues are not relevant, there will be a different comment than something that does fail. Let's see, let's find our contrast. Dun, dun, dun. So here's our contrast issues. Components do not meet the minimum contrast requirements, and it has the list of what the exceptions are and a link to those issues. Um, you can change this, of course. You can export this as, as a different format and change it if you want, but this will give you a massive head start on, uh, on creating a VPAT. So, what is next for Mortis? Uh, first off, uh, these are all coming very soon, uh, hopefully first quarter of the year. Some UX enhancements, we already saw some of those uh, taking place. Uh, some additional permissions schemes. So right now, um, anybody who you invite to your project is considered a collaborator. Um, and so they are able to add and edit content in the report. Uh, moving forward, we will have, whoa, we will have different permission schemes for read-only users. Uh, some improvements to the issue exporting um, uh, process. 
Uh, one of those is going to be just some differences in the in the way that the data is, is formatted. Uh, VPAT ACRs right now are limited only to uh, WCAG. We're going to be adding Section 508 and EN 301 549. Uh, integrated auto testing is going to be awesome. What will happen is when you do that auto detect process that I mentioned before, uh, it will automatically test your components with, with the Tenon product and also the Tenon product is uh, 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 those API calls are going to be free when you use Mortis. Uh, configuration of the report content, you'll be able to configure uh, the branding on the front, you'll be able to configure basic CSS, uh, and you'll also be able to uh, choose what to include in the, in the reports and what not to include. Uh, the dashboarding is going to be improved. We saw that list of, of projects on the redesign. That's going to be, that's going to be uh, enhanced even further to show some of the metrics on the reports, such as, you know, um, uh, compliance information. And then some rules management. So the checklist that we have now is the checklist that everybody gets. However, we, were, we are going to be adding the ability for enterprise customers to um, add or remove the rules that we have. So in summary, uh, why Mortis? Well, one is it's going to allow uh, people to reduce their dependence on outside consultants. Yes, uh, a good bit of the revenue that Tenon makes as a company is in doing consulting, but we also recognize that, that at a certain point, the customers are going to need to want to become self-sufficient. And that's a good thing. It's, it will mean that they have matured enough that they don't need us anymore, but they still need the, uh, they, they still need their own processes and this is going to help them. This introduces uh, massive, massively higher degrees of accuracy and repeatability to your processes. Frankly speaking, if nobody ever bought Mortis from me, I would be happy because it's still making a huge impact on our business and in our ability to deliver, uh, to deliver um, the, uh, the, the accuracy and repeatability that we want out of our work. Uh, this allows you to iterate on your accessibility more rapidly. You can create a new, uh, you can create a, a, a new project with every sprint. You can create components for that project that only reflect what's in the sprint. And there you go. Uh, and so you can iterate on that on that accessibility as the uh, as the work is iterated as well. Finally, it allows you to constantly understand your compliance. You have no questions uh, when you use Mortis about where things stand because you have the data. So with that, I do have one question uh, one question in the Q and A, and I will answer that. If anybody else has any questions, totally fine. Please enter them in the Q and A. Unfortunately, it's the, it's the way webinars work with Zoom. Uh, so uh, our attendee says, do the items in the Mortis checklist reflect the highest priority items that Tenon has discovered from manual testing doing audits? Uh, this is a two-part question, so I'll answer the second part of your question after the first. So the checklists really are, it's, it, the way it's evolved is pretty interesting because when we started as a company and we started doing uh, we started doing audits because Tenant started as a product only company. Um, when we started doing audits, we did start by looking through a lot of the past audits that we had done. Uh, that the team that I put together, we had all done past audits and stuff. When we we decided we were going to sort of put together a checklist of things. And so we just gathered together the data from the past audits that we had done and during our careers, and we put a, a checklist from that. And since then, it has sort of evolved, and it actually is constantly evolving uh, as we speak, so that we can get full coverage as much as possible. So there might be, frankly, there might be things that we don't have in there. Um, for instance, Flash stuff. Flash has reached end of life anyway, but we don't end up testing a lot of flash, so we don't put that any flash specific stuff in there. But the checklist does, in my opinion, at least at this point in, in, in the company's evolution, reflect pretty much the full array of things that you might want to possibly check for. If there isn't, we want to hear about it. 
the second part of the question was that how much training is included when a license is purchased? We give this training every month. Uh, this is a monthly training that I just did. And so anybody and everybody who can, who, who wants to attend can attend and get that training. If a customer needs more specific training or needs maybe Q and A or something like that, we'll do that for free as well too. Our goal for our customers is for them to be successful and it's mutually beneficial to do so. The more successful they are, the more likely they are to renew their subscription to the product. And so therefore we are deeply interested in making sure they're successful. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all for attending. Uh, this was recorded and so you should get a link to the recording from Zoom that you can uh, review at your leisure. If you are interested in getting a license to Mortis or want to talk about perhaps a combination uh, of our offerings of Mortis and Tenon and the uh, Tenon Sentinel product, give us a shout. My email is there, carl at tenon.io. Our phone number uh, is 443-875-7343. And I hope to hear from you soon.